Hi everyone, this is Professor M. Science, and today I want to discuss the Fox space in another one of our videos on rigorous quantum mechanics. The very first postulate of quantum mechanics tells us that all the action happens in a vector space called the state space. In many situations, all we need to consider is a fixed number of particles. In this context, we've been discussing how to work with state spaces for a fixed number of particles, ranging from one-dimensional problems all the way to multiparticle systems where we had to consider tensor product state spaces. Today, I want to take this one step further and introduce the state space that allows us to consider a variable number of particles. The state space is called the Fock space, named after Vladimir Fock. It is the space in which quantum mechanics happens when we work in the second quantization formalism, and it plays a major role in areas ranging from quantum field theory to quantum statistical mechanics. So let's go! Today's video is mostly about definitions, but bear with me because they are quite specific and it is easy to get them mixed up. Consider a system of n identical quantum particles, whose states are given in the occupation number representation by listing the number of particles in each single particle state as written here. Remember that this means that we consider a particular single particle basis U, and there are n1 particles in state U1, n2 particles in state U2, and so on, so in general we have nk particles in state UK. The total number of particles in the system is capital N, obtained by summing over all occupation numbers. States like this one up here have well-defined occupation numbers, given by the nk values, and have a well-defined total number of particles, given by the capital N. States with a well-defined number of particles are called Fock states. You will remember from the video on the symmetrization postulate that for bosons, the state space to which these Fock states belong to is made of totally symmetric kets of n particles, and we call this subspace V+. For fermions, the state space to which the Fock states belong to is made of totally antisymmetric heads of n particles, and we call it V minus. We will represent the collective state space of a system of identical particles, whether it is made of bosons or fermions, by a calligraphic F with a capital N subindex, indicating the total number of particles n in the system. For example, F1 is the state space of a single particle, F2 is the state space of two particle systems, and so on. And importantly for what follows, we're also going to define F0 as the space containing zero particles. We're now ready to define the Fock space. We write it with a calligraphic F without any subindex, and it is the state space formed by the direct sum of the state spaces associated with zero particles, one particle, two particles, and so on. First, a quick refresher of direct sums of vector spaces. For the vector space Vp of dimension p, and the second one Vq of dimension q, then the direct sum of Vp and Vq is another vector space of dimension p plus q. If p is a vector in Vp, and q is a vector in Vq, then the direct sum space is spanned by all linear combinations of a vector from space Vp and one from space Vq. As such, a basis for Vp plus q is simply obtained by combining the individual bases for Vp and Vq. So what does this mean for the Fock space? It is the space spanned by the occupation number states for all possible numbers of particles. As such, we can form a basis of the Fock space by combining the bases of all individual Fn spaces. Another important point is that by construction, two cats with different numbers of particles are orthogonal to each other. Remembering that the Fock state has a fixed number of particles, then we see that the Fock state is simply a state that belongs to a subspace Fn of the Fock space. As we will see in many other videos, a very important Fock state is the so-called vacuum state, which corresponds to zero particles. We denote it by a bracket with a label zero, and it is the state belonging to the one-dimensional state space F0. The power of Fock space is that it allows us to go beyond the fixed number of particles that Fock states describe. We can do that by forming linear superpositions of states corresponding to different numbers of particles. A simple example is this state here, in which I am using the simplified notation where we only include the occupation numbers of the occupied states, apart from the vacuum state, which is always zero. So in this language, this is a state that is a superposition state of the vacuum state, a single particle state, 
and a two-particle state in which the two particles occupy two different states. This state has some amplitude of having zero particles, some of having one particle, and some of having two particles. A state like this one is a very clear example of how Fox space allows us to treat systems with a variable number of particles. So to finish, let's ask again, why do we care about Fox space? There are two main reasons. The first is that it provides a very natural language to describe physical situations in which there is a variable number of particles. The two best known examples of this are on the one hand quantum field theory, the relativistic theory of quantum mechanics, where for example we have creation and annihilation of particles and antiparticles, and on the other hand quantum statistical mechanics, where a system can be in equilibrium with a particle reservoir with which it exchanges particles and is described within the grand canonical ensemble. The second is a more practical reason. Fox space is a very useful mathematical tool to describe systems with a fixed number of particles, in which during the calculation we may allow for the number of particles to change, but at the end of the calculation we always recover the fixed number of particles we started with. In this context, Fox space provides a very natural language to study systems of identical particles. This is because the resulting mathematics is much simpler when compared to the many terms that one has to deal with if we instead use the symmetrized permanence or anti-symmetrized slater determinants that I introduced in the video on the symmetrization postulate. The very last thing I want to mention is that given the structure of Fox space, it will be essential to study the operators that allow us to change the number of particles, as these operators will allow us to navigate the Fox space. These operators are called creation and annihilation operators for obvious reasons, and I encourage you to check out the corresponding videos linked in the description. Putting together the occupation number representation in Fox space with these operators forms the basis of the formalism known as second quantization. The Fox space provides the platform on which we can do quantum mechanics when the number of particles isn't fixed. As such, it underpins areas such as quantum field theory, where we have creation and annihilation of particles and antiparticles, or quantum statistical mechanics, where our system can exchange particles with a reservoir. So now that we know about the structure of the Fox space, the next thing we need to do is to learn how to navigate this Fox space. And for that, you should check the videos on the creation and annihilation operators of both bosons and fermions. If you like the video or would like to send me suggestions for future videos, please subscribe.